What are the best and worst quad exercises for muscle growth? Well, in this video, I'll be ranking 20 of the most popular movements on a tier list from S for super to F for fail. And at the end, I'll crown one exercise as the best of the best and one as the worst of the worst. And for a quad exercise to get into S tier, it needs to tick three boxes. First, high quad tension, especially in the stretched position. Second, it needs to feel good. That means it doesn't cause knee pain and it has a smooth resistance profile. Third, it needs to have a simple progression. That means you can apply progressive overload by either adding some weight or a rep from week to week. Now, as I'm sure you all know, there are four heads of the quadriceps, hence the quad prefects. Actually, one recent anatomy paper suggested that there could be a fifth head, but if it does exist in some of us, I don't think it changes anything training wise. The four heads are the vastus medialis, also known as the teardrop muscle on the inside, the vastus intermedius, which runs down the middle, the vastus lateralis on the outside, and finally there's the rectus femoris, which is a long flat head that also runs down the middle on top of the other heads. All four heads contract to perform knee extension, which is when you straighten your knee out. So every exercise we'll cover performs knee extension. However, one head, that long flat rectus femoris, has a second function. It also performs something called hip flexion, which is when you raise your leg up to the front. Keep this in mind for later. All right, let's get the worst out of the way so you guys don't waste any time on them. Let's see, squat combination exercises like the squat plus press and the lunge plus curl are going straight to F tier. That's because your quads are way stronger than your shoulders or your arms, so your upper body is always gonna fatigue well before your quads. Bosu ball squats are so bad, I didn't even film them. The problem is because they're so unstable, your ankle ends up doing a lot of the stabilization work and that severely limits the amount of tension that your quads receive. They might have some utility in some athletic contexts, but for building muscle, Bosu ball squats are going straight to F tier. All right, so what about the most popular quad exercise of all time, the barbell back squat? Well, let's see. It offers high tension on the quads deep in the hole when they're most stretched. They should feel good, especially once you lock in your bar path, and they might be one of the best exercises for progressive overload, period. You can always add a little weight or a rep each week as you gain size and strength. Now, because it's a free weight squat, your spinal erectors will have to do some stabilization, but that's not a deal breaker in my opinion. Your quads are still the prime movers, and if you need any proof that squats can build some monster quads, just go to a powerlifting meet. All the biggest squatters will have some massive quads, and I don't think I've ever seen an exception to that. Now, some anatomy enjoyers will point out that the rectus femoris head is not maximally activated by the squat because unlike the other three heads, it's shortening at the knee while lengthening at the hip. This is true. However, studies still show pretty solid rectus femoris growth with squats. And as long as you include one other exercise in your program that we'll get to, this concern completely goes away. So while the mild anatomy concern almost pulls it back to A tier, I just can't take the barbell back squat out of S tier without a guilty conscience. The barbell front squat has all the same upsides of the barbell back squat, except it actually shifts even more tension to the quads. That's because where the barbell center of mass is shifted forward in front of your neck, you're forced to keep a more upright posture so you don't fall over. This increases the moment arm to the knee joint, placing more tension on the quads. That said, the forward bar position will also force your upper back to work harder, and some coaches will argue that this causes your upper back to become the limiting factor. I don't fully agree. Unless you're going super heavy, you really should be able to keep your elbows up and you should be able to get your quads close to failure without your back giving out first. Now, front squats will lose a few points in the feels good department for some of you, but remember that for bodybuilding, you can use the two finger grip, the crossed arm grip, or the strap grip whatever feels best. From there, just focus on keeping your elbows up, squatting down between your legs, and standing back up with a tall chest. I'm gonna put these in A tier because despite activating the quads a bit more, I find enough people just hate doing them or find the bar position awkward, and I don't think there's enough of a tension shift to trump that. If you can do them comfortably though, I'd have no problem if you bump them up to S tier. Okay, so we've covered a high bar back squat in a front squat. What about a low bar back squat? For a low bar squat, you shift the barbell down two or three inches so it sits on your rear delts instead of your upper traps. And research shows that while this technique will allow you to load more total weight, it actually shifts some of the tension away from your quads and onto your glutes. This isn't a complete deal breaker though, because you still see extremely high quad activity as long as you're squatting to a reasonable depth. Low bar squats are going in A tier as well. The hack squat is a long time bodybuilding staple and it ticks all the same boxes as the barbell squat, plus it has a few extra benefits. You can generally get your sets done a bit faster because there's less setup. You'll be a bit more locked in, meaning less stabilization work and potentially more direct 
correct quad tension, and you can play with your foot position to find a comfortable spot without worrying about your balance. Contrary to popular belief, the latest science shows that on average, free weights and machines can both build muscle roughly equally as long as you're pushing your sets hard. This is truly a brilliant quad builder, and it's obviously going in S tier. The pendulum squat is similar to the hack squat, except the weight moves up and down in an arc. I actually find this resistance path feels more natural than the linear hack squat, so these movements just keep getting better and better. That said, most gyms don't have a pendulum squat, so not everyone will be able to do it. I still think it belongs in S tier though. All right, last squat type movement for now. The Smith machine squat seems to be a bit more accepted now than it was four or five years ago, especially as more top bodybuilders gravitate to it. I think the best thing about the Smith machine is that you can actually push your quads close to or to failure without that same fear of falling over or needing to dump the bar. And other than potentially reduce stabilizer involvement, it really is the same basic movement pattern as the free weight barbell squat. And so for hypertrophy, it also has to go in S tier. All right, let's move on to the 45 degree leg press. Since you're also flexing and extending the knee, the quads will of course receive high tension. However, I do find that a lot of leg presses don't allow me to get as deep as I can get on a squat. Again, as far as hypertrophy is concerned, the deeper you can get, the better. So if you're not able to get your calves to your glutes, you might not be getting as much out of a leg press as you would out of a deep squat. Outside of that though, leg presses do generally feel good and they are good for overload. I'm gonna put them in A tier. Now, the horizontal leg press is worse in my opinion because they almost always have even more limited range of motion. So it'll be harder to get high tension in the deep stretch. And once your legs get decently strong, you'll probably max out the machine, which means overload is gonna be more limited for intermediate to advanced lifters. The horizontal leg press is going in C tier. The lunge is a better glute builder than it is a quad builder in my experience, even though it will grow both. You get some stretch and some tension on the quads, but not as much as you get on the glutes. They do feel good, but if you're doing them right, you should feel your glutes more than your quads. You can get the quads more involved by taking more shallow steps, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think they're best utilized and best thought of as a glute builder. As a quad exercise, they're going in B tier, but I'd say they'd probably be A or S tier for glute growth. All right, the leg extension. This is a surprisingly controversial one. Some people say that they're bad for your knees, but this has been thoroughly debunked. Now, if you have bad knees or they give you knee pain, you should go easy on them, but there's no convincing evidence that they cause knee issues any more than any other quad exercise. But the great thing about the leg extension is that your hips are fixed. This means that unlike squat-based exercises, your rectus femoris will actually stretch and contract here. This makes it the first exercise where all four heads of the quads will be highly engaged. This is even more the case if you set the seat back. In fact, a brand new study found significantly more overall quad growth and especially more rectus femoris growth with the seat back leg extension position. That's most likely because it places the rectus femoris under more stretch, or it at least trains it at a longer muscle length. Assuming you're leaning back and you've got a machine that stretches your quads well, I think they're good enough to get into A tier. They don't have quite the same overload potential as squats do. And even though some studies do show similar leg growth between leg extensions and squats, those are short-term studies. And I'm just frankly doubtful that doing leg extensions will net you the same quad gains as doing squats over the long term. That said, they're still a staple on my leg days and they're an exercise I definitely think is worth including. All right, the reverse Nordic is the same basic movement pattern as a leg extension, except they have the added benefit of being more accessible. You don't need a leg extension machine to do them. You can also get a much deeper stretch on your quads here. The slight negative though, is that they are really tough, meaning beginners might struggle with them and they can be hard to overload with weight. So you're a bit more limited on your overload options. You can still add a rep each week though, or try to get a bit deeper. And because the stretch is S tier on these and they're so accessible, I'm gonna put them in A tier overall. But if you find them really awkward, I'd be cool if you drop them back a tier or two. All right, let's knock out three final squat variations. One that I love, one that I hate, and one that's just okay. Goblet squats are biomechanically very similar to a barbell front squat, so they will highly activate your quads, but because you have to hold a dumbbell in your hands, they're actually a lot harder to overload. Once your quads get decently strong, you'll be able to squat a lot more weight than you'll be able to comfortably hold. So the goblet squat will quickly be limited to high rep sets only. These days, I generally only use it in two contexts, for teaching the squat to beginners and as a high rep finisher exercise. These are just okay for me, and I'm putting them in C or B tier. I guess B tier, since they definitely can have their place. Jump squats will burn some calories, and they aren't terrible for building explosive power, but as a muscle builder, there are just too many other better options out there that'll provide more tension and more overload. I'm not a fan of these for hypertrophy, so they're going in F tier. Bulgarian split squats are brutal, but they sure do work. You'll get a huge stretch on your quads, and doing each leg unilaterally can be very helpful for preventing any left to right muscle imbalances. 
But because they're so fatiguing and psychologically challenging, I usually only program two sets of these per workout. Your quads will get more sore doing these than on almost any other exercise. And while soreness isn't a one-to-one -one predictor of hypertrophy, in this case, I think it is a good indication that you're hitting the right muscle. I'm putting Bulgarian split squats in S tier. Deadlifts do activate the quads, but not nearly as much as squats do. That's not surprising when you look at the side view. As far as the quads are concerned, a deadlift is basically a quarter squat. You'll get a bit more quad involvement if you deadlift with a sumo stance, but they still don't hold a candle to squats for quad growth. They're a much better glute builder, and they're an excellent overall strength builder, but for quadriceps and muscle growth, deadlifts are going in C tier. Step ups are equally not fun as Bulgarian split squats, but also less effective because you get less quad stretch and they're less stable. They do offer a pretty solid glute stimulus though, especially if you avoid lifting off your back foot, and they can have their place, but overall, I'm feeling C tier on these. Pistol squats are an impressive movement if you can do them, but the lack of stability and overload limitations knock them down quite a bit for me. If you're limited to at-home workouts or body weight training, I think they're great, but assuming you have gym access, there are just so many better options. I'm gonna put pistol squats in C tier as a quad builder. Sissy squats are similar to reverse Nordics in that they get a huge stretch on your quads, and don't let the name deceive you, these are very challenging. That said, they're a bit harder to load, so I find I'm mainly limited to adding reps when it comes to progressive overload, and I find that they have more of a learning curve than the other squat options. People can also find it awkward going up onto their toes and getting their knees all the way forward, but if you can get the technique down, I do think they're probably the best squat option for getting into a super deep stretch on the quads. So despite some limitations, I'm feeling A or B tier on these. I do find them a bit awkward though, so let's go with B tier. All right, and if I had to crown just one exercise as the best of the best for quad growth, I think I'd have to go with a hack squat. I personally find the pendulum squat feels better, but because most gyms don't have one, I'll go with a hack squat. The one issue with hacks is that on some machines, you can't get to full depth without coming up solid. If that's the case for you, try adding some yoga blocks on top of your shoulders, and then you'll be able to get all the way down. And if your gym doesn't have a hack squat, I'd say a high bar barbell back squat would be my alternate go-to as a number one quad builder. And if I had to pick one exercise as the worst of the worst, I guess it'd have to be the BOSU ball squat. Just get rid of the BOSU ball and it immediately becomes more stable, more safe, and more effective. Now, do you know the best and worst triceps exercises? If not, you gotta check out my new video on triceps training over here. And that's it for this one, guys. Don't forget to leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one.